The Hoover Institution is the nation's preeminent research center dedicated to generating policy ideas that promote economic prosperity, national security, and democratic governance. Hoover Research has directly led to policies that have produced greater opportunity and freedom in the United States and the world. How has Hoover achieved this distinction? By assembling an extraordinary fellowship of policy-oriented academics and scholarly practitioners. By offering open access to a world-renowned library and archives, and by resolutely focusing on ideas that define a free society. Herbert Hoover is the founder of the institution that bears his name. After graduating in Stanford's pioneer class in 1895, he became a successful mining engineer, renowned humanitarian, and president of the United States. While administering famine relief to Belgium during World War I, and participating in the subsequent Paris Peace Conference, Hoover recognized the importance of collecting historical material that could yield knowledge about preventing a recurrence of the calamities he had witnessed in Europe. In April 1919, he pledged $50,000 to Stanford University to support his war collection. We celebrate this pivotal moment 100 years ago as the founding of what was to become the Hoover Institution. By 1929, Hoover's War Library contained 1.4 million items and had already become the largest in the world, focused on the Great War and its aftermath. Collecting expanded to include material related to social, political, and economic change in the 20th century. Hoover Tower was completed in 1941 to house the rapidly growing library and archive. In 1957, the collection was definitively renamed the Hoover Institution on War, Revolution, and Peace. Hoover's vision for the institution is captured in a statement to the Stanford Board of Trustees in 1959. The institution supports the Constitution of the United States, its Bill of Rights, and its method of representative government. The overall mission of this institution is, from its records, to recall the voice of experience against the making of war, and by the study of these records and their publication, to recall man's endeavors to make and preserve peace. The institution itself must constantly and dynamically point the road to peace, to personal freedom, and to the safeguards of the American system. By the 1970s, the institution was generating influential research on government regulation, tax policy, healthcare, social security, energy, and proposals to limit government expenditures. Many innovative public policy proposals developed by Hoover Fellows were adopted in the 1980s, and Hoover contributed influential policy ideas for countering communism that ultimately led to the collapse of the former Soviet Union in 1991. The all-voluntary army, the flat tax, the Taylor Rule for monetary policy, and school choice and accountability are all transformative policy ideas generated by Hoover Fellows. Hoover's timeless fundamental values of freedom, private enterprise, and limited effective representative government derive from 100 years of scholarship and the lessons of history. The Hoover Institution is poised for even greater impact in the years ahead, informing the marketplace of ideas, guiding the country's policymakers, and illuminating the road to prosperity and peace in America and around the world. This lecture series brings together Hoover Fellows to discuss how the ideas and values that have undergirded the institution for 100 years remain crucial in understanding and formulating public policy in the 21st century. The lecture is really intended to help us uh, look at the state of democracy today. But of course, there's a long history of the state of democracy. And the Hoover Institution has had a central role through the people who've been here in really shaping the ideas that define a free society. Uh, we've had, of course, uh, people here who have studied uh, the role of democracy in society. People like Larry Diamond, uh, who has done that. And of course, we've had a couple of secretaries of state as well who've tried to put the ideas into practice. Uh, of course, George Schultz, and uh, I've been one of those as well. 
And so Hoover has really played a central role, as uh, an academic think tank should, in bringing great ideas to policy dilemmas. And there really is no more important dilemma than the role of democracy in American foreign policy. The United States has played a really unique role in uh, balancing power among nations because it has done so from both its power and its interest and its values. The United States is in many ways unique as a great power because America is an idea. It's an idea that people who come from many different backgrounds, uh, from many different ethnic, national, religious backgrounds, can self-govern. And that's an idea that has caught on across the world, but it's been hard. It's been hard to think about a way in which uh, people who are so diverse would indeed take responsibility for governing themselves. And so the United States has stood as uh, the greatest example of this, uh, not because the United States is perfect, but because the United States is constantly on a journey toward a greater union, a greater democracy. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Gilligan. I'm the director of the Hoover Institution. I'm pleased to have you join us as we celebrate the institution's 100th year anniversary. In recognition of this momentous occasion, we have organized a centennial speaker series titled A Century of Ideas for a Free Society. This series features 11 panel discussions that span the course of the year to showcase the rigorous scholarship and research central to the institution's mission and values. I would like to welcome you to the first session of this series titled 100 Years of Democracy and Foreign Policy. Let me introduce the participants of today's discussion that will address the, the changing role of democracy in American foreign policy over the past century. Neil Ferguson. Neil is the Milbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and a Senior Fellow at the Center for European Studies at Harvard, where he served for 12 years as the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of History. Stephen Krasner. Stephen is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, the Graham H. Stewart Chair in International Relations in Stanford's Political Science Department, and a senior fellow in the Freeman Spogli Institute. From 2005 to 2007, he served under Secretary, uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice as the Director of Policy Planning at the State Department, where he worked on foreign assistance reform and other projects. And lastly, Condoleezza Rice. Annalisa is the Thomas and Barbara Stevenson Senior Fellow on pu of Public Policy at the Hoover Institution, the Denning Professor in the global, uh, of Global Business in the Graduate School of Business, and a Professor of Political Science at Stanford. From January of 2005 to 2009, she served as the 66th Secretary of State of the United States. She also served as President George W. Bush's Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs from January of 2001 to 2005. Please join me as this esteemed group comes to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to have a little discussion here about the subject of this panel, uh, democracy and American foreign policy, a rather hot topic these days, I would say. Um, and then after we've talked for a while, we're going to invite you to ask questions. Um, I want to remind everybody that I am a professor. I will call on somebody if nobody asks a question. So please, there are microphones. Uh, get your questions ready. I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Neil Ferguson and Steve Krasner uh, for this important uh, discussion of one of the greater dilemmas of uh, foreign policy. So if we go back 100 years when the Hoover Institution was founded, uh, we would have seen a world in which uh, the Russian Revolution um, had taken place. Uh, but the country was uh, still in civil war. Uh, many of the people who were you know, in that civil war would escape Russia, and some of them would end up here at the Hoover Institution. One of the things that is uh, not said about the Hoover Archives is that it has a tremendous collection 
about the Russian uh, Revolution. And um, the man who, after the Tsar's abdication, um, Kerensky had taken Russia for just a moment toward democracy, overthrown by the Bolsheviks, would actually spend the last years of his life here at the Hoover Institution. Um, we could also note that at that time, 1919, we would have seen the end of World War I. And uh, the American president, uh, Woodrow Wilson, who believed that we had or would make the world safe for democracy, would suggest that in fact democracy and foreign policy had to be linked for a country with America's values. Do you see today, uh, when we're seeing uh, the rise of what I call the four horsemen of the apocalypse, populism, nativism, isolationism, protectionism, uh, do you see any similarities to where we are now with uh, that period uh, 100 years ago? So, uh, Neil, why don't you start? Well, I, I'm delighted to be here with you, Condé, to mark this centenary, and it was great to be reminded in that video that we are an institution that studies war, revolution, and peace, and we had our origins in Herbert Hoover's remarkable collection of documents. So it's good that we should begin with a history question. You know, looking back on Woodrow Wilson, historians are often tempted to portray him as a failure because ultimately his vision of uh, an international order based on collective security under the League of Nations failed. Not only did it fail to prevent World War II, it failed earlier than that when the United States Senate refused to ratify it. And Wilson's career seemed to end in failure. But when you look at the way we run the world or try to run the world today, it's striking how many of, of Wilson's ideas are central to our concept of international order. Free trade was something that he regarded as an important part of a post-war order. Self-determination, uh, nation's right to choose to be uh, independent. That was another key uh, element in his famous 14 points. Uh, and then the idea of collective security, although it failed in the League of Nations, was reborn uh, in version 2.0 in the United Nations. And, and I, I think when you look at the concepts that Woodrow Wilson set out during World War I in his 14 points, it's remarkable how ultimately so many of those have come to be the basis of our, of our international system. Yeah. Steve? What you well, just let me say that I yeah. think, I, you know, Woodrow Wilson is a, a complicated figure. So Neil has told us something about the more, you know, optimistic ways of looking at Wilson, but he tried to make the world safe for democracy. He failed. Um, as part, of, he never worked out clearly how he would deal with minority rights, uh, which are a very elaborated part of the Versailles Treaty. He was himself a racist, um, so that, in some ways, I mean, the question is: Should we look at Wilson as someone who is a harbinger of the future, or should we look at Wilson as really a symbol of how difficult it is uh, to achieve a consolidated democracy? Uh, that's, that's, that's really a central question for us. And I think, you know, achieving consolidated democracy is, is, is difficult. Madison said in the Federalist 51 that if men were ruled by angels, we wouldn't need institutions. But men are ruled by other men, uh, so we need institutions. And reaching the Madisonian sweet spot, which is something the United States and a few other countries have accomplished, in which the government is both effective and constrained, is something which hasn't really been achieved by very many polities. So I think a central question for us is really understanding, you know, can uh, countries really reach the Madisonian sweet spot? What are the preconditions, if any, for reaching it? Uh, what can we do as outside actors to facilitate that? Well, let's go for a moment to this question of uh, consolidated democracy and how consolidated is it really across the world? I think we all know uh, that there's a kind of uh, debate out there uh, among academics, but it's seeped into the, to the public and uh, consciousness, which is that democracy as a concept and democracy in practice uh, may indeed be in trouble. That uh, not only was Wilson 
um, a harbinger of how difficult it would be to actually bring democracy around the world, but he was perhaps a harbinger of how hard it is to keep it once you have it. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the state of democracy before we talk about the state of democracy and American foreign policy. So in general, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you each through parts of the world and have you talk specifically about how democracy is doing, doing in certain parts of the world. So let's talk generally first about the state of democracy. Um, one of our colleagues, um, Larry Diamond, talks about democracy in recession. Uh, people talk about a democracy deficit. Uh, how do you see the state of democracy today? Neil? I'm less worried than those people who, like Larry, talk about a democratic recession. It, it depends really where you, you start your time series. Uh, if you start your time series sometime after 1989, you can find some, some modest retreat in recent years. But if you start your time series in the mid-1970s, uh, there has been, without question, a massive shift in favor of democracy and to the disadvantage of authoritarian regimes. I went back and looked at some of the numbers ahead of our conversation, looking at the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit's uh, Democracy Index. Roughly half of the world's population live in democracies, according to that, uh, that series. Uh, 16% live in what they call hybrid, half democratic, half authoritarian or illiberal democracies and maybe a third are in authoritarian regimes. But when you look at the economics, which is another thing we try and do at Hoover, uh, it's really striking that the democracies account for 74% of global gross domestic product. The so-called illiberal democracies, 4%, and the authoritarians, 22%, that's nearly all China. So when you look at it that way, it seems pretty clear that illiberal democracy is not a winning option in economic terms, and democracy is a winning option. And the real story here, I think, is not so much your four horsemen. I'm, I'm kind of less worried about populism than, than some. I think the key issue is China. That's not populism, that's communism. That's a one-party state, which is a holdout from mid-20th century totalitarianism. If that were to be taken out of the story, then democracy would, I think, have, have won overwhelmingly. And I could imagine that happening. Let's face it, nobody really expected, or at least very few people expected, the complete collapse of Soviet communism in the period 89 to 91. So I think we shouldn't be too pessimistic. Much of what you're talking about when you, you talk about four horsemen of the apocalypse, the populism and nativism, protectionism, I, I don't see that as fundamentally undemocratic. I think those are necessary checks. You might call it the backlash against globalization, which many ordinary Americans and Europeans felt was long overdue. I don't think populism is fundamentally hostile to democracy in the way that fascism and communism were. So if you go back 100 years, what was coming to Europe at that point, or indeed had already arrived in Russia and some Central European countries, was something much scarier than populism. Uh, people faced a choice between communism and then an extreme uh, fascism. Uh, and those are much more dangerous things. And today, they, they barely represent a threat, except insofar as communism is, is still in power in the largest country in the world. So Steve, why do people talk about a democratic deficit or a democratic recession uh, when one looks at the quite compelling numbers that uh, Neil has given us? 74% of the uh, GDP uh, belonging to uh, democratic states, uh, only 22% uh, to authoritarians, and that is mostly China. So why shouldn't we be celebrating uh, the well, okay. democracy I think rather than, than mourning it as some have? I, I think we should be worried in that we're, we're not on kind of a teleological path. There's no natural way in which countries end up being democratic. Um, it's true that the wealthy countries in the world are countries that have governments which are effective and constrained. Uh, given that, I mean, one would think that democracy would sweep the world. That has not necessarily been the case. We're also confronted with very dynamic changes. You look at the technological revolution, which we're sitting in the middle of. Um, you know, the first industrial revolution, I mean, it, countries went from being 90% agrarian to being 5% agrarian. Um, so you were dealing with this, and you, you had two world wars in the middle of that, plus the Russian Revolution. Um, if any of you have seen the movie Dunkirk, uh, 
Now, imagine if the sea had been rough when the British were trying to evacuate their, tr their troops from the continent of Europe. They might not have been successful. If they'd been unsuccessful, they might have sued Germany for a separate peace. If they'd sued Germany for a separate peace, well, maybe World War II would have ended up the same way, but maybe not. So there is, I think, if you're thinking about reaching consolidated democracy, um, there's an element, that inevitably an element of luck to it, and no guarantee that it signals the future for the human race. Well, let me break it down just a little bit and go through several of the arguments that people would uh, make to say that the bleaker look at democracy is actually more appropriate. So um, probably number one would be people have lost faith in their democratic institutions. And this is true across even consolidated democracies. We all know those polls about how Americans feel about their Congress, uh, how Americans feel about the media, how they feel about uh, even uh, the, the uh, Supreme Court at this point. Really, the only institution that seems to have widespread support in the United States would be the military. So uh, how are we to think about the lack of faith in institutions um, as a harbinger for trouble for democracy going forward. Because, Neil, you, you make the very good point that populism isn't necessarily anti-democratic, but it is a force that says go around your institutions, go around your elites directly to the people. That is the sort of definition of populism. So um, this breakdown of faith in institutions, which Madison would have said was absolutely essential to self-governing, uh, is that one reason to be concerned about democracy? No, I think it's a wake-up call to the institutions. I mean, you mentioned uh, just then the media, uh, and it's certainly true that public respect for the media, for a free press, is at a very low ebb in the United States, but can you blame people for feeling that way? Uh, can you blame people for having a very low view of professional politicians, uh, of legislators in Congress? It seems to me that it's entirely understandable that the public feels that way. And the fact that it has a high level of respect for the military uh, is also significant, because that wasn't true in the 1970s at the time of Vietnam. And what we could, what can see in the military is uh, it learned some important lessons from Vietnam and has done an enormously good job of cleaning up its act and winning back public respect. And Connie, that is what the media have to do because they have lost it. And I think they've lost it badly. Uh, and I don't need to go into the, uh, the examples that spring to mind here uh, from the Covington Catholic fiasco uh, to the coverage, uh, the breathless coverage of the Mueller uh, uh, inquiry until it turned out not to be what the media had led people to expect. So I don't think it's surprising that there is low trust in some of our institutions, but I think it's a healthy phenomenon if, if, if the people, if voters express their frustration with political establishments, as they most certainly did in 2016 on both sides of the Atlantic, well, political establishments had it coming. They made a succession of disastrous mistakes, uh, of which the financial crisis was probably the, the last straw. And from my vantage point, what we're seeing here is not a threat to democracy, nor to the institutions, but a wake-up call to the institutions. And I'll make one more point. At the time that President Trump was elected, some academics got into a great lather and predicted American tyranny, the fall of the Constitution, the end of democracy. That all seems absurd. It seemed absurd to me at the time, but now I think it should seem absurd to everybody because actually the institutions have held up perfectly well to this somewhat mercurial, idiosyncratic president. I see no sign that the rule of law has been subverted by the Trump administration. I see every sign that the Constitution has held up and that separation of power still functions. So I think we shouldn't worry that the institutions are being criticized as long as they're not being subverted, which I don't think they are being. Mm -hmm. Steve, respond to the a second of those uh, ideas. Uh, authoritarians are doing better. And therefore, the authoritarian model, or the illiberal model, as some people call it, uh, is really the new way that countries are thinking about their potential for success. And of course, as, as Neil mentioned, China would be um, exhibit one. So I think it will probably fail, but I have to, in honesty, I, I've made this for 15 years. I've been saying China would fail. I have a friend in the Department of Defense. And he always says to me, you know, you've been telling me the same thing for 15 years. They haven't failed. 
Now, I think, I mean, what are the, what are the possibilities for China? It, it could become wealthy and remain autocratic, which would be unprecedented. We have no country like that except Singapore, which is pretty small. Um, it could sort of stall out at middle income. Um, it could collapse. It, it could even collapse into civil war. Now, I think it's unlikely that China will become wealthy and remain autocratic because it would require having, well, as, as our, our colleague Frank Fujiyama has said, I mean, you're always confronted with the bad emperor problem. It may be okay if Xi Jinping is president, but it's not so, not so great if Mao is head of the government. Um, so I think China will fail. We can't be certain. The problem is, though, I think if you're thinking about challenges to democracy, they are really challenges. If you look at the Senate in the United States, I mean, I, I know 10 years ago, I was, it was really amazing if you look at the American Constitution that it had been in place for more than two centuries. If you compare that with the constitutional history of any other major country, I mean, there have been major dramatic changes. Um, but you look at the U.S. Constitution now, the Senate is becoming less and less democratic. The ratio of the most populous state to the least populous state in 1787 was, I think, 13 to 1. Now it's more, which was Delaware to Virginia. Now it's more than 60 to 1. It's not clear how you can have constitutional change. I mean, it is also clear, as I said, that we're in the midst of a technological revolution. I mean, what happens in 50 years when people are working two hours a week? which is, uh, you know, it's impossible to predict, but that's, that's a possibility. How will people understand themselves? So that I think, yes, these, we do have real challenges, and people are really unhappy about how the government has functioned. Um, we can't be complacent about the challenges being responded to in an appropriate or, or how, what we would think of as the right way. Um, just one point about authoritarians, and then I, I have another challenge for democracy. You know, there is this funny thing uh, with what I call authoritarian envy, uh, which is that uh, there are kind of two states that are noted. One is Singapore, which is really, really tiny. The other is China, which is really, really big. And of course, uh, authoritarians make really bad decisions too. So the Chinese uh, decided on something called the one-child policy. And uh, it was very efficiently carried out. That's one thing authoritarians can do. They can carry things out efficiently. Democracies are kind of messy, and they, they fall all over themselves and their veto groups, but e efficiency. Now, 34 million Chinese men don't have mates. So authoritarians very often carry out good, uh, bad decisions efficiently, and it's just something to remember when we have authoritarian envy. But I want to move on to another challenge that people discuss. Our colleague uh, George Schultz will very often say that the big challenge today is governing over diversity. Uh, we are, the United States in particular, a uh, multi-ethnic, multi-religious uh, society where identity um, has uh, taken some hits as to what actually constitutes American identity. Um, how much of a challenge is it to govern over diverse populations uh, that know each other very, very well these days because of the, the smaller circles in which we uh, go? That, that, by the way, uh, because of the way that they get their news and their information, can get into echo groups. And when I'm going to date myself, when I was a kid, my family watched uh, the Huntley Brinkley Report every night. Well, some people watched Walter Cronkite, but we had pretty much the same version of the Vietnam War, the same version of uh, the moonshot. But now I can go to my cable news channel, my bloggers, my websites. I never encounter anybody who thinks differently. And so diversity is becoming, um, instead of we are all diverse but together, I go to my tribe. How much of a challenge is that to democracy? And it's not just the United States, of course. We see it across the world. Well, I think there are two different problems, uh, one of which is an old one and one of which is new. The percentage of the population in the United States that is foreign-born is now back to 14% where it was in the late 19th century. It went down substantially in the mid-20th century when there was significantly less immigration. And not surprisingly, we are seeing many of the, the political responses to that diversity that we saw in the late 19th century. I've been arguing 
for what feels like years now, that the populism that produced uh, President Trump is quite a familiar American strain of populism. Uh, because in a period of rapid change, when people see big changes in the, the population because of immigration, some people react and say, we need to limit this. Not, not to stop it altogether. I don't think many people make that argument, but to limit it. That happened in the late 19th century. So I think the United States is much better set up to deal with that challenge than any other country in the world because it's done it successfully before. Each new incoming uh, cohort is initially viewed with suspicion. Remember how the Irish were viewed or the Italians were viewed in the late 19th century and nobody would think twice now uh, about that. I think the United States gives itself a very hard time about this despite the fact that it's been pretty successful historically at integrating newcomers and I think it's also made enormous strides uh, with respect to the central problem of American history which is the racial problem arising from slavery. We're in a fantastically better place uh, now than we were when I first came to this country as a young uh, schoolboy in the uh, early 1980s. The, the new problem is the technology problem that you alluded to. Because of the rise of the network platforms on the internet and the creation of algorithms that propel us down rabbit holes of conspiracy theory that propel us out to the extremes of the political spectrum, we've created a very much more unstable public sphere than we had before. And that, I think, is the real problem. It's not our, uh, our identities, it's our identity politics as mediated through very polarizing, well, engines of polarization, engines of confirmation bias. Uh, things like YouTube or Twitter, we can, sh we can show that those drive people out to the extremes. They incentivize fake news and extreme views. And that's a problem that we haven't figured out yet. I don't think we're in much better of a place than we were in 2016 in this respect. In some ways, it's actually got worse. So that's the problem we should really focus on. Identity politics in its most bitter and intense forms is clearly being encouraged by the echo chambers and the, and the filter bubbles of the internet. And the regulatory landscape hasn't changed at all. If anything, things have got rather worse because people start to think that the network platforms are engaged in censorship, which in some ways they are. Uh, so I think the atmosphere is extremely toxic online. It's getting more toxic. And we haven't yet figured out politically what to do about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to ignore that uh, Neil just said that he was a schoolboy in 1980. Um, and, uh, I was. <laughs> I had just left Glasgow Academy and I came here for yeah, the very that, first that's, time then. That's remarkable, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, do you want to respond? So, look, it's definitely true that, I mean, we have this echo chamber, but I think the problem is a, a really deep one. I mean, if you went back five years, only five years, would have said more information. Well, more information is better. There's more transparency. That's a great thing. I, I mean, I would have said that. I think all of my colleagues would have said that. Now we're not so certain, but we don't have a response. So it's not just that there's an echo chamber, but we don't have a kind of ideational understanding of what we want the media to be. Um, more information, it looks now as if more information is not necessarily better. Um, it may even be worse, it may be highly problematic, but we have no way of talking about the contemporary environment. That's really a hard problem for us. I just want to add one thing, I, I mean, where I do agree with Neil that the United States, I think, is better positioned, well, because as, my, as Condi has argued, um, it's a country which is based on ideas. I think other countries, if you look at other democracies around the world, they've largely been based on ethnicities. So it's even a more difficult problem for them. So I think the, the problem for the US is, 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 is less. But we still have, if you look at the ethnicity, um, you know, you look at the history of black Americans in the US, one of the most shocking things I actually saw in the, in the New York Times in the last two years is that the ratio, even at the 90th percentile, the ratio of black income to white income had not changed since 1965. And it was something like uh, two thirds of white income. Um, school segregation, schools are more segregated now than they have been in earlier periods. I went to one of the exam high schools in New York City. So here's Mayor de Blasio giving, you know, it's really been a, a, a typical democratic trope for the last 30 years, which is, well, you know, we hardly have any blacks or Puerto Ricans in these schools, so let's find some other way of admitting them. Well, how exactly is that supposed to work, and what are the alternatives? 
So they're, they're really hard problems, even for the US, and I think they're even harder problems for Europe, um, or not to speak of Japan, where ethnicity has been a central issue in the def definition of what it means to be British or German or French. Mm -hmm. Let me turn to some of these places now. We've talked to sort of about the, the state of democracy as a concept, the state of democracy in terms of institutions and a little bit about the United States. Um, but let's talk about some of the other places. Uh, the, the United States' greatest allies, or its democratic allies, um, in Europe in particular, um, long-standing ties of history and tradition. Uh, how's Europe doing in terms of democracy? Fine. <laughs> Fine. I, can, I, I, I would say as per usual. So as per usual, British politics is a kind of Jacobean tragedy uh, in which everybody is stabbing everybody else uh, in the back. And unless you know 17th century constitutional history, you don't have a clue what's going on. But I mean, at some point, the Queen is going to step in, I feel sure, uh, to end the oh, agony. That, that'll be democratic. Brexit. No, no, sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> But that's how British politics works. Yes. Uh, and, and the French have a, their own style of politics, which is that periodically presidents imagine themselves to be uh, Louis XIV. <laughs> and then lots of people run into the streets of Paris to say, no, no, you're Louis XVI. Uh, <laughs> just because they're wearing yellow vests rather than short trousers, sans culottes, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't deceive you. It's the same old, same old way of, but of doing things. What's the modern version of the guillotine? Well. <laughs> This is what Monsieur Macron has been pondering of late. <laughs> uh, that compared with European politics at the time this institution was founded, uh, the danger of a democratic crisis in Europe is vanishingly small. I mean, at the time the institution was founded, there were revolutions going on in Central Europe, uh, and the democracies that were created out of the various peace treaties at Paris, most had died uh, by the 1930s. And, and in fact, really only Czechoslovakia made it to World War II. The rest had ceased to be democracies by the time the war began. So we, we've come a very long way since then. Yeah, you can worry about what is happening in Poland and Hungary and say that democracy is in retreat there and the government is increasingly playing fast and loose with the constitution and the rule of law. But I mean, compared with what we've experienced in the past, uh, I don't think it's a huge amount to get worked up about. The European Union has many defects, but one of its obvious benefits is to constrain member states from stepping too far away from democratic norms. And you can see that in action right now with both Poland and Hungary. So I think the picture is, in fact, a pretty bright one. The problems that, Europe's, uh, that Europe is grappling with, which are partly demographic in nature, have to do with uh, slow economic growth in countries like Italy, I don't, I don't think they're problems that fundamentally undermine democracy. They just make it very hard to run a democratic government. There's that old joke, was it Jean-Claude Juncker, who said, you know, we know the structural reforms that we have to do, we just don't know how to survive doing them. Uh, it's extremely hard to be a kind of two-term president or a two-term prime minister uh, under those conditions when growth is relatively low. And you're managing welfare states that evolved in the period after 1945 at a time when populations had a much different age structure. Those things are really hard to fix. Macron, with all his charisma, has been able to make only relatively small changes to the very uh, burdensome uh, French welfare state. So that's the kind of problem that European leaders have to deal with. Every now and then it gets exciting. It got exciting when British voters decided to gamble on, on Brexit, to break away from the European Union in 2016. But look how that has ended in, in a state of such political complexity that I begin to doubt that they will be able to do it, that they may actually fail to execute Brexit despite having received a democratic mandate for it. Now, that could lead Britain into some very dangerous waters, and I'm sure if Brexit doesn't happen, the people who voted for it will feel extremely bitter and will probably turn to even more populist figures. But will democracy come under threat? No, yeah. I don't think so. Well, but let me ask you about the European Union, because uh, the idea of the European Union was, first of all, that it was pre to prevent wars by putting everybody into a democratic union. Uh, Germany would be powerful but not dangerous, seems to have worked. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, some would say that uh, the key institutions of the, of the European Union are in fact anti-democratic. 
So uh, one has the European Parliament, which actually doesn't do that much. Um, people go to the European Parliament so they can either get elected to a real parliament or to retire. Um, the uh, European Court of Justice is always in a tug of war with national courts. The Council of Europe is really uh, the heads of state and government, so that's always going to be more sovereign oriented. And then you have the commission that nobody elected that is telling people um, what their budget targets have to be uh, all the way to what constitutes olive oil or cheese. Now some would say this isn't a very democratic looking institution and that's what people are reacting to. Um, do, you, do you not think that that is a problem for the European Union? Yes and no. I mean, I, I'm a Eurosceptic by uh, instinct. I was very opposed to some of the centralizing measures that led to the monetary union, for example. But I was against Brexit because I didn't see that it was ultimately in Britain's interest or in Europe's interest for Britain to leave the EU. Uh, the way I would think about it is this. The British historian Alan Millward made the argument that the real point of the European Union, of European integration, was to rescue the nation states of continental Europe after the disaster of the world wars, and particularly of World War II. And in fact, what is striking about the European Union is that it has done that. It allowed what were rather shaky states in countries such as uh, Italy and what was then West Germany, and indeed France, which had a record of political instability, to stabilize within a structure that was essentially confederal. I think Europe's problems have arisen because some European leaders decided to go the next step to full-blown federalism. And it's been that attempt to create a federal Europe with powers in truly federal institutions like the European Court and like the European Central Bank that has created the strains and stresses of a system that actually had been working quite well up until that point. If you rerun the financial crisis without the ECB and without the Euro, Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal would have had far less disruptive experiences, mm -hmm. I'm sure. So I think that's really the way to think about the problem. One final point, which goes to something that Steve talks about. Europe confronts right now a bigger challenge with immigration than the United States. The, the volumes of people capable of getting to Europe across various channels of the Mediterranean are absolutely huge, potentially. And this is the real challenge that Europe faces. At the national level, one country after another is producing populist leaders who object to immigration. At the European level, they cannot arrive at a collective solution. And I think that's the thing that's ultimately going to unravel this attempt to, to United States of Europe. I think the United States of Europe as a project was doomed from the outset. They should have stuck with what they'd got to in the 1980s. Because remember, the Single European Act was something that Margaret Thatcher's government pushed for. There was a time when Europe was really taking a rather British shape. That all went wrong after Maastricht with the project of monetary union. Mm -hmm. Steve, let me ask you about a couple of other parts of the world, and then you can perhaps use that to talk a little bit about our last subject, which really is what some call democracy promotion, or let's just call it the role of uh, democracy in American foreign policy. So talk a little bit about other places. Uh, there is a huge democracy in India that actually manages to have uh, consequential elections with a billion people who don't speak the same language and don't worship the same God. Uh, there's Latin America, which when I taught in the 80s when Neil was a schoolboy uh, <laughs> here at Stanford, um, I would always teach a course on civil military relations and I always had at least two or three Latin American juntas to teach about in Brazil or in Chile. They're now almost all democratic with the exception of Cuba and the exception, of course, of Venezuela, which uh, is now uh, a royal mess. But talk a little bit about how democracy is doing in other places, uh, Africa, Latin America. If we think about, um, you know, most of these, uh, you know, if we look at a lot of African countries, they're pretty autocratic. If we look at recent developments in Brazil or even in Mexico, everything about Brazil I found surprising. So an ex-president has ended up in jail. The, but the level of the corruption scandal was enormous. Um, they've elected someone, at least, at least according to the American press, is pretty right wing. So it isn't to say that there's a kind of natural order of evolution where everyone becomes a consolidated democracy and everything is great. I mean, I think that's the problem. If we look around the world, you know, it's only been in peace. It's only, been, it's only North America, Western Europe, which has done very well, Eastern Europe, far more problematic, parts of East Asia, which have actually reached consolidated democracy. So should we think this is a natural order of things, or 
Yeah, well, you end up, I mean, Brazil scores pretty well if you look at these indicators of democratization. But it, it also is, it's a, it's a pretty messy place. It's surprisingly messy. You know, surprising that the level of corruption was so high, surprising that Lula went to jail, was I thought of all of the heads of state that I met a pretty impressive guy uh, who's now in jail. Surprising that his successor is an ex-military guy. It isn't to say that they'll go back to the military, but it isn't to say it isn't, it also doesn't mean that there's some natural order in which we all end up as consolidated democracies and that we all reach the Madisonian sweet spot. That might happen, but it might not. It takes both external actors, but I think it also takes internal developments and luck. Yeah. Can I just say, I'm much more optimistic than Steve about Latin America because the, the populism of the left has failed so spectacularly in Venezuela, which is now in a state of complete anarchy, that it's really hard to make the argument for those policies ever again. And what you're seeing, not only in Brazil, but in, in, in Argentina and Chile, I think is a gradual stabilization of the political process around democratic norms. Bolsonaro does get a very bad, the new Brazilian president does get a very bum rap in the American press. But remember what I said about the American media? Don't believe what you read, because if you look at the economic policies that they're implementing down there, they are the kind of policies that we at Hoover would be in favor of, liberalization, fiscal reform. Uh, I mean, the Paulo Guedes, who's his super economics minister, is the kind of guy we should be giving our, our uh, enthusiastic support to, because if they can deliver economic results, then I'm absolutely sure that the democratic institutions will stay that. Well, let me go back to something that Steve mentioned. He said it takes, takes uh, internal developments, but it also takes external actors. So the premise of um, American uh, democracy promotion, or I like to call it democracy support, because uh, you, it, people say you shouldn't impose democracy. Well, actually, you kind of impose tyranny. There are few people in the world who actually want to live under tyranny, although uh, getting to consolidate a democracy is hard. So the premise uh, has been that these are indeed universal values, that the United States should therefore support them because they are universal, and that the United States should have the tools and use those tools uh, to support those who want to have the same rights that we have. The right to say what you think, the right to be free from the knock of the secret police at night, the right to worship freely. Uh, human rights has long been a part of uh, America's uh, foreign policy doctrine. So, uh, Steve, if indeed uh, they're not necessarily universal, um, are we as Americans barking up the wrong tree? So the values might be universal, but I think the problem is how do we find the right horse to bet on? So if you look at Japan in the post-World War II period, I mean, who'd we better on? We'd better on the emperor. We'd better on the Ministry of Commerce, which became Miti. We'd better on, on some of the Japanese Zaibatsu, which then became Keiretsu. These were not people who loved democracy. If you think about religious freedom, religious freedom begins in Europe in 1648, not because the rulers of Europe believed in religious freedom, but because religion was so volatile um, they just had the Thirty Years' War in the center of Europe, they'd had the religious wars in France, they'd had the English Civil Wars, um, that they decided they had to somehow find a way of getting religion out of, out of politics, and what they settled on was religious toleration. I mean, there was an official religion, but you could so do what you wanted to do, provided you did it outside the city walls, you did it inside your own private house. So I think the problem is to find the right, the right horse to bet on, that can often be difficult because it doesn't necessarily mean that the right horse is a democratic horse. And the Emperor Hirohito was no Democrat. It's just that what he was looking at was a worse alternative if the Americans had not supported him. So, and I think that's hard to do from the outside. It's not impossible, but it's hard to do. Well, the lesson of the Cold War is that the United States absolutely should speak up for basic human freedoms. Uh, because by doing that, uh, to an extent that I think policymakers at the time slightly underestimated, we helped to encourage the dissidents, to encourage the oppositional forces in the Soviet system and in the Soviet bloc in Eastern Europe. And we also gradually helped to delegitimize a tyrannical system. Now, I think we're going to see a rerun of this process to an extent that may surprise us as relations between the United States and China uh, cool uh, and we end up in something 
somewhat reminiscent of the Cold War. The one thing that we have got going for us is our commitment to individual freedom. The one thing that Xi Jinping is most definitely against is individual freedom. And the tightening of restrictions in individual freedom in China is one of the most striking features of the last eight years or so. It is something that is most egregious uh, in the treatment of the Uyghur uh, Muslim minority in, uh, in Western China. The United States has to speak up about that and be true to our values. No, we're not trying to export a, a template of American democracy and American culture, but we do, I think, always need to stand on the side of individual freedom uh, because by doing that, it seems to me, we, we achieve the kind of soft power that Joe Nye has talked about. It's a very inexpensive kind of power. Uh, and I think it's still an extraordinarily potent force. Uh, and I think it's going to become really, really important in the US-China relationship, which, as I said earlier, is really the key relationship if what you're worried about is the future of democracy. If the Chinese regime succeeds in maintaining 6% growth for the foreseeable future, it will become the largest economy in the world. If it succeeds in its artificial intelligence program, it will become technologically our equal, conceivably even our superior. The stakes are very high if that power is in the hands of a one-party state that is cracking down on individual and minority dissent. So this is, this is not you know, the old Cold War. This is a new Cold War that's shaping up here. Steve, would you agree? Uh, so we should remember, I mean, so what's the, the sort of um, iconic story about China? In the 15th century, the Chinese had a fleet that was much larger. Um, the ships were much larger. The number of men on the ships were much more substantial than anything possessed by Europe. They were halfway down the coast of East Africa when they were called back by the Emperor of China, who then ordered the fleet destroyed. And he ordered it destroyed because he saw it as being a threat to his own rule. That's why I think China will ultimately fail. Um, so there's a difference between saying, yes, do people want individual freedom? Yes, they do. Will they necessarily be able to create a governmental system that will bring that to them, um, which consolidated democracy says, does? I would say not necessarily. If you look at the Cold War period, um, there's a very tight relationship between levels of per capita income and democratization, except for the period from 1945 to 1990. Why is that the case? Because obviously the Soviet Union wasn't interested in democracy, and the United States gave only lip service to it. Um, we were more interested in making sure that we had autocratic rulers who supported us than autocratic rulers that supported the Soviet Union. So there's not any automaticity to this, pro this process. I think in finding, I mean, I think the problem with China is, you know, if you look at, at the history of American relations with China from Nixon through Obama, what did we assume? We assumed the Chinese would be just like us. Well, guess what? They ended up being just like Chinese. They weren't just like us. Um, and I think one thing that the present administration has done very well is make that absolutely clear. Um, but it isn't to say that there's an, the fact that there is a kind of yearning for individual freedom isn't the same thing as saying that you'll be able to construct, you know, that you'll reach the Madisonian sweet spot. Well, let me just uh, throw something out. We didn't reach the Madisonian sweet spot for a long time either. <laughs> so Great. is this actually more of a question of time? So if one looks at the history of the United States, democracy as we are defining it, the Madisonian sweet spot, almost failed several times. I mean, John Adams was a, a rather uh, unpleasant fellow, it turns out, who didn't like to be criticized. And had he been reelected, we would have had something called the Alien and Sedition Act, where it would have been illegal to criticize the president. Now, current president doesn't like being criticized. No president likes being criticized, but we don't have any laws against it. We might have. Uh, if you look at the United States uh, and corruption, um, until at least Teddy Roosevelt, corruption was rampant in uh, the American patronage, buying of positions, et cetera. It was really only the professionalization of the civil service under Roosevelt that began to change that. Uh, if one looks at uh, the United States in terms of minority rights, uh, I couldn't go to a movie theater in my hometown. Uh, so, is this really, an, are, did the United States reach the Madisonian sweet spot so easily that we shouldn't say to others, look, maybe it just takes you time uh, 
to find that place at which people can self-govern through institutions uh, rather than through tribe or family or ethnic group. Because when you think about it, democracy is a rather odd concept. I ought to trust my interests, my rights to these abstractions called constitutions and rule of law and elections and so forth. So, Shouldn't Americans be more patient with those who are trying to find the Madison, Madisonian sweet spot, this is, given our history? Right, this is really the central question. I mean, is it, do we have a kind of teleological development in human history towards democracy or not? I would say not. Um, it has happened in some places. I think there's been a big element of luck in that, like having the weather be right when you had this evacuation from Dunkirk. Um, it's possible, but it's not automatic. That I, that's my worry. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no automaticity to thinking that you'll get to the Madisonian sweet spot. I mean, it's absolutely right to say it took the U.S. a long time. And it's been very, un, you know, development in the U.S. has been very uneven. And there, but there are very powerful institutions in the U.S. now that push in that direction. I mean, one of the things that kind of amazes me about the Soviet Union is that no one kills Stalin. Why not? I mean, here... I mean, he was killing your wife. You're sending your wife off to jail. No one killed him. It's hard, hard to overthrow autocratic rulers. So all I would say is, yes, we might reach this Madisonian sweet spot. It takes a long time, but there's no automaticity to it. Can I push back against the theory that the weather won World War II? <laughs> I mean, come on. Uh, there is absolutely no conceivable way that I can think of historically that the Nazis could have won World War II because of Hitler's determination to go to war with the Soviet Union, which was bound to end in calamity for him. Uh, but you also should remember that even if Dunkirk had gone a lot worse, and it went pretty badly, let's remember this was a massive retreat, a massive evacuation, not a military victory, uh, the strength of the British Empire was still such that Hitler would not have dared an amphibious invasion well, of the United it, Kingdom. We also had something which we should not lose sight of, which is leadership. It wasn't the weather that decided the outcome at Dunkirk. It was Winston Churchill's leadership. And I think we should never succumb to the theory of history that says it's not about human agency. It's about the weather. Uh, that's important because it allows me to pivot to the issue of the gradual I will nature. give Steve a, Steve a chance to respond, but please, yes, right, yeah. <laughs> I don't think he can. Yeah. Uh, the gradual... Well, we may not have time to. <laughs> that's what I'm relying on. <laughs> Gra gradualism is the key. Edmund Burke made this argument brilliantly in his reflections on the revolution in France. It was the disruptive character of the French Revolution that he correctly predicted would lead to bloodshed and, and tyranny. He was altogether more approving of what was happening uh, in Britain's American colonies because that was a much more gradual process whereby colonial assemblies asserted their right of self-government. There was not a breach of the rule of law in the American Revolution. So I, I, I think you're right and I think British history illustrates it all almost as well, if not better, than American history. Institutions have to evolve to democracy gradually. You can't simply wave a wand and say, hold elections and expect everything to work out fine in all the different contexts where that's been tried. You know that better than anybody, Condi. Well, I just have, I'm going to turn to the audience, but I just do, I can't resist a couple of points here. You know, I was, uh, when I was uh, secretary, I was uh, sitting before the Senate uh, in one of those uh, awful moments where you're uh, being interrogated in what is called a hearing. And um, I was uh, asked by a sitting senator how the United States could have agreed to such a bad compromise in the Afghan constitution where the Afghans had cited both Sharia law and individual liberties in the preamble. And I said, well, Senator, it wasn't half as bad as the compromise that made my ancestors three-fifths of a man in the American constitution. And so just something to remember about time. Um, and with all due respect, Neil, as to whether. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hitler did mistime his attack on the Soviet Union and got caught in something that Napoleon did as well. It's called winter. Yeah. It would have been hard for him to avoid winter uh, <laughs> at some point in that campaign, yeah. <laughs> even with all the power of Blitzkrieg. Yeah. Er er earlier might have helped. All right, we're going to turn uh, to you now. So if you'll come to the microphones uh, to ask questions.
uh, we'll just alternate between the microphones. Uh, so, sir, you have the first question at this microphone. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how our values inform foreign policy. We seem to be able to embrace Saudi Arabia um, and their human rights and brutally murdering a journalist and we want to sell them weapons. And then we vilify Iran and 50 years ago the CIA executed a coup with a nascent democracy um, and that seemed to be in our best interest to overthrow a duly elected democratic government. Mm -hmm. Who'd like to take it? Down? Sounds like a perfect question for a former Secretary of State. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take the bait. Um, Indeed, you, you do talk about this central dilemma if you're actually having to make foreign policy. Um, I said when I read the Khashoggi um, news that that's the day when as Secretary of State you just want to go back to bed because the fact of the matter is the United States is not an NGO. Um, it has values, but it also has interests. And so uh, when you're confronted with an ally or um, a, a, an ally that is not that does not share your values, the hardest thing is to be true to your values and yet recognize that sometimes you have strategic interests uh, that mean that you have to keep that relationship alive. The United States can't cut off a relationship with Saudi Arabia for a whole uh, host of reasons, including the fact by the, by the fact that Iran is the most disruptive and dangerous state uh, in the Middle East. And a decision to cut off weapon sales to, uh, to the Saudis will most certainly embolden uh, Iran that is uh, against our interests. And so you're right. Uh, you're very often um, trying to walk and chew gum at the same time. You try to be true to your interests. I think one mistake we made in the Saudi case, we were not outspoken enough about what had happened there not condemnatory enough about what had happened there. And that therefore gave the president no room uh, to then say, but we do have to keep alive a relationship with Saudi Arabia. But it's a very, very uh, difficult problem. And we faced it several times, including uh, with Egypt, where we were arguing for uh, democracy in Egypt and still having to deal with a strong man like Mubarak because uh, we had to deal with a strong man like Mubarak. Very it should be problem. said that, of course, the other pillar of um, American policy in the Middle East is its relationship with the true democracy in that region, which is Israel. And uh, however many uh, criticisms one may make of recent policy, it has been quite successful in building up uh, Arab support, implicit or explicit, for Israel and against Iran. Israel's strategic position has massively improved as a result of this, and I think this is one of the achievements of recent years of American policy in the region. Yes. Sir. Yes, hi. First of all, thank you so much for this. This is wonderful. Um, my question is, I was expecting to hear a little bit more about capitalism, free markets, globalization, and trade as a force you know, affecting democratization of the world. I didn't hear you guys talking a lot about that, but it does seem as though the China case is very different than the Soviet case. The Chinese have integrated into the capitalist global trading system. The Soviets never did. And I'm wondering if that paints a different picture for the future. I know, you know, China hasn't turned out quite the way we had hoped, but is there a pathway short of collapse that might somehow arc China more toward democracy. I've just been in Beijing. I was at the China Development uh, Forum. And it's important to bear in mind that the trend of recent years in China has been away from market capitalism yeah. towards state capitalism, that credit is uh, channeled towards the state-owned enterprises uh, rather than to the private sector companies that the government in Beijing views with considerable suspicion the most successful businesses in China, which are the big tech companies, uh, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Uh, a mistake that I think people commonly make is to say, oh, the Chinese have become capitalists, but that's not quite true. What's actually happened is that an extraordinary market economy has formed around what is still a state-controlled economy. Uh, a friend of mine who works in the Chinese uh, tech sector put it like this, Neil, there are three Chinas. New, new China, which is the, the tech companies, the market elements. Yeah. New, old China, which is the party and the profitable state-owned enterprises from which they extract their rents. And old, old China, which is the, the Rust Belt, uh, un unprofitable SOEs. Um, one last point. I think we bent the rules 
for China, and we turned a blind eye to their b even further bending and indeed breaking the rules after Chinese uh, World Trade Organization accession. And I think one of the most uh, uh, positive developments of the Trump administration, I want to echo something that Steve said earlier, has been this new and tougher line holding China accountable for its multiple transgressions. Uh, it's not capitalism if you're stealing intellectual property. That's piracy. And the, the Chinese have based for too long their economic development on the theft of other people's intellectual property. And I'm glad to say that we have an administration that has called time on that. Yes. Thank you, sir. Hi. Um, Condoleezza, you uh, remarked a little bit at the beginning about the threats to democracy and about how we're all in a sort of uh, press bubble. And I think the idea of a free press is a very important one. You know, we're here at the Hoover Institution. Uh, Neil, you very, uh, I think, well put the evolution of the ways that we interact with the world. You know, we, most of us in this room have a cell phone and the idea of how we engage with the press, I think is very, very different from the constitutional, um, you know, uh, uh, foundation. So I just want to ask you to comment more about that because I think, like again, in this idea of the threat to democracy, and this idea of, and this age of like net neutrality being bounced around, uh, you know, is it an FCC thing? Is it, you know, we have California mm -hmm. uh, enacting its own laws. So I think it's an important question that I'd like to hear your thoughts on. Yeah, uh, Neil, you've actually done work on this. Uh, yeah, I, I should yeah, credit course, yeah. George Schultz, uh, who I'm delighted to see is, is here this afternoon with forcing me to think about what we should do. I wrote a book called The Square and the Tower about the history of networks and I pointed out all the problems that had arisen from the, the rise of the network platforms uh, and George Schultz said, well that's all very well but what are we going to do about it, young man? And I, uh, and I, 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 I sat down and I, I was part of the series of, of conferences he's held on, on governance in an age of new technology, tried to figure this out. And, and I think there are two things we need to do. I don't buy the idea that these tech companies need to be broken up. I don't think antitrust is the way to go. I don't buy the idea that we need to have a really powerful federal regulator that's going to uh, take control of the sector, because look how well that works in other sectors of our economy. I think we need to do two things. I think we need to look very hard at Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act that exempts the network platforms for, from any liability for the content that appears in those platforms. That seems to me an anachronism now that these are the biggest corporations and the most powerful corporations in the world and certainly in our public sphere. But at the same time, I think we need to require a quasi-First Amendment obligation on them so that they do not become the new censors of the American public sphere, which increasingly they are becoming, using their somewhat opaque user agreements to crack down on anybody they think is guilty of hate speech, which, by the way, is a euphemism for blasphemy, heresy, or something you just don't like. So I think those are the two things that we need to do to make them liable for the harms that arise from stuff that goes online, like videos of people shooting uh, innocent people, and at the same time, make sure that they don't censor us, make sure that we have free speech in what has become the new public sphere. Thank you. Yes, sir. Great. Um, so in, in regards to threats to democracy and um, institutional failure, in I guess it was 2014, Martin Gurry wrote Revolt to the Public, which has uh, elite failure basically at the center of it. And it's sort of in the intellectual legacy of James Scott seeing like a state and all this stuff. And his whole point is that American democracy is in danger because the government is essentially making promises to deliver economic growth and all these things about these systems that are just too complex for us to really know what's going on. You know, and when I was a schoolboy, you know, the, uh, the, the two towers went down on 9-11. You know, we're still in Afghanistan. You know, I lived through the uh, bank bailouts and all this stuff. And so, to, you know, how seriously should we be taking this idea that, you know, modern government, especially in the age of the Internet, where everybody's failures are out there in the open and you can't sort of hide them anymore because you control the three cable news channels, like how big of a threat is that to the next 50 years of democracy? Steve, do you have a comment? Well, so let me say, I think what's difficult, I think one thing you said which is absolutely correct is, you know, it's hard to figure out what's, go what's going on. It's hard to figure out in your own country. It's hard to, even harder to figure out in other countries. So I asked, if I asked any of us now to, to tell me what you think, uh, 
How will people be living 50 years from now? What will they be working? How many hours a day will they be working? It's really hard to predict. So I think, you know, if you want to have a government that works effectively, to some extent it has to be reactive to a set of developments that are taking place, which is, if you think about making internet companies or software companies liable, which they haven't been up to now, that looked like a bad idea 15 years ago because it suppressed innovation. It actually looks to me like a good idea now. So I think all you can do is kind of react. Don't think that you're going to be able to predict with confidence how the future will actually evolve. Can I add something to that? Yeah, please. Centralization is the great enemy here. Tocqueville understood this. Uh, the way of dealing with the problems that of, of modernity is not to have a centralized state with some kind of all-knowing planner in charge, which is essentially the Chinese model. Our problems arise from the fact that we in the United States allowed centralization to happen, allowed the administrative straight state to spring up from the 1970s onwards, forgot that the real genius of the American system lies partly in its decentralization. And that seems to me the thing that we've, we've kind of forgotten. Everybody should take a trip to Switzerland, which is the last example of a developed economy that has remained politically decentralized. I would love to see us getting back to something which invested less power in the federal government and more power in the states and local communities. Well, in fact, one of the one of the gifts that the founders gave us was federalism, um, and they had reserved to the states anything that was not explicitly reserved for the federal government, and we have evolved. But that seems to be taking some steps back as people recognize that the complexity that you rightly identify uh, can be better understood if uh, the govern those who govern you are closer to you. And so you see the states as experimenting with uh, different, just, just one example, so everybody's concerned these days about retraining uh, because of the job skills mismatch. We have 37 federal job training programs, uh, some of them as small as $1 million. It, they don't do anything. So perhaps block granting back to the states because training in Vermont or in California or in Texas will look different. And so this question of how complexity and centralization work together, I think, is a very fruitful uh, place to go. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, uh, good evening, panelists and ladies and gentlemen. So I have a quick question on the democracy on a macroscopic level. So um, from what I know is that the, uh, in the Security Council itself, five countries currently hold the veto power. Um, in order to consolidate power and uh, to protect national interests after World War II. And because of that, um, you can pass, sorry, you can prevent the passing of any substantive um, resolution within the Security Council. So how do you view this contradiction for a country which champions democracy um, to hold an authoritative decision over the world? And what is the future of a veto power um, in an increasing democratic um, world? Well, in, in a sense, and but the, the gentleman who asked the question about Saudi Arabia, this is also a, it's a, an issue in uh, what, you, what you note. Look, the United States was, along with Russia uh, at the time, the Soviet Union, China, and others, going to protect its ability to, uh, to be dominant in issues of interest to it. And so the veto was given to the five permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, that makes it very difficult to do anything in the Security Council in which the interests of the five powers are in one way or another not aligned. So we were able to do resolutions on North Korea but not on Syria, for instance. Um, I don't think it's going to change. In fact, there was an effort when I was secretary by the so-called Group of Four, uh, Japan, uh, Brazil, uh, Germany, and India to join the Security Council as permanent members, it ran afoul, and as secretary, I found myself going around saying that we will reform the Security Council at an appropriate time, meaning probably never. <laughs> uh, what it has caused, though, is that the Security Council has become less the place that one goes to get resolution of matters of war and peace. Regional uh, institutions do more of that, so when the United States and its allies felt that they had to ask in Kosovo, they went through NATO. And I think that's what is really happening. The, the Security Council veto system, I think, is not going to change, but people will start to go around it to do what they need to do. Yes. yes hi. Um, now that President Trump has been exonerated um, of all these silly charges, uh, my, my question is to one, straight, one is for you. Um,
Don't we have now an opportunity to end 19 years of war um, and to move on it aggressively and uh, strongly? President Trump can do that. And Trump's ability to organize the kinds of economic cooperation with China and other nations, um, I think these are the two things that I would like to know what you think about this, uh, especially the exoneration of Trump. What does that mean? I think you can't just put that aside as well as very good or very bad. What happens in the next years will be coming out of the Trump administration, period. Yeah. Uh, I think we've talked about the China uh, issue in economics, but does somebody want to take on the perpetual war issue? Well, you know, I think the problem, if you look at the situation in Afghanistan, it wasn't a place where you would have expected consolidated democracy in any short period of time. I, I think the problem that we're confronted with, and this partly deals with the earlier question that was asked, is you have these constitutional decisions like the uh, permanent members of the Security Council or even the U.S. Senate, which are taken at particular moments in time and are then difficult to change later on. Um, if, so that I think you, you get locked in place by decisions which are taken by human beings at particular moments in time they seem to be very wise. They won't necessarily be wise in, in the future. And one of the problems I think I, if you're thinking about Afghanistan, and many people have written about this, is, is super empowered individuals. So there's a very, um, say, alarming uh, set of pages in Steve Cole's recent book about Pakistan in which some Pakistan naval officers actually um, tried to steal some nuclear weapons in Pakistan, put them on boats in, in the Indian Ocean, and use them against India. Um, if you think about uh, the spread of pandemic diseases, well, some of them may occur naturally, but given the modern technology that we, we have, it only requires a good MA in biology or maybe even a BA in biology to put together a smallpox um, epidemic, infect yourself, hang out at O'Hare Airport for a couple of weeks, uh, before the disease starts to manifest itself and start a global epidemic. So I think the problem, if you think about Afghanistan, is that it wasn't a place that we could have left alone because 9-11, while it turned out to be exceptional, didn't, we didn't think it would be exceptional at the moment when it happened. And I think it's taken a lot of effort to make it exceptional. But we're dealing with this situation in which levels of death which could only be accomplished at earlier historical periods in wartime can now be um, imposed on us by relatively small numbers of people um, operating from countries that have very limited resources. So I think the danger is, is there. We have to be alert to that and we're confronted with this contradiction which uh, Kandi alluded to which is that our interests and our values, I mean, I mean it's fine when they're aligned, um, but there will be times when they won't be aligned. Saudi Arabia is an example of that. And when they're not aligned, we're confronted with some really difficult choices. I'm going to ask uh, the, the question and answers to ask your questions, and then we'll try to take them all because we're going to run out of time, and I want everybody to get their question in. So, sir. Thank you. So we started by talking about, you know, 100 years ago, and I was wondering, do you believe that we are kind of headed back in that direction because we have a lot of isolationism, a lot of anti-immigration stance, you know, things like that. Are we kind of going back to that kind of phase? And then also, I'm looking to the future. Do you believe our next major military conflict will be with China or if not, with which country? Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in when you're talking about democracy um, promotion. Uh, and I'm, I'm assuming you mean a pathway to like peace and prosperity for other countries. But the reality is that, you know, both the United States and Great Britain, that involved uh, military imperialism and economic exploitation of other countries. And though, you know, Mr. Ferguson says we need to stand up to China on humanitarian issues and someone's posed the Saudi Arabia question, the fact is, is that our GDP is greatly influenced by the exploitation of transnational companies of, of cheap labor. And I don't think the difference between what our people want, which is life chances, living wages, I mean, when I talk to my friends in mainland China, is different than what Americans want. And how do you kind of address democracy um, uh, 
democracy you know, promotion, when the reality is, is that our democracy, what we consider our democracy, does um, have an exploitive component to it. And that we still are, our, our transnational corporations, I believe Mr. Krasner in your book on state sovereignty and power, talks about how our, our policies, our foreign policies, are influenced by these transnational corporations. Thank you, yes. So just briefly, uh, anecdotal here. So uh, just recently I ran for Congress and uh, I lost, I'm here today. Um, that's okay, Don't, no regrets. But two things that people should understand about someone running for Congress. Um, number one, you spend about five hours a day asking people for money. And I did that for 22 months straight. Um, the other reality is that I was once told early on, do not think about national policy. Yet at the same time, my whole purpose for actually running was to represent and to focus on national policy, something I did in the past. Um, but I was said, don't think about that at all. That doesn't really matter. And even when you're in, you're going to have to learn a heck of a lot. You're going to be a freshman. You're going to have to really get back in the cubicle and ask for a lot more money. So how do we deal with an institution mm -hmm. based on things that I don't think are the purpose behind its design? Thank you. Sir? Uh, I have a question about great paradox. If you look at 1649 with the English Civil War, 1776 with the American Revolution, 1917 with the uh, Russian Revolution, and you look at, um, you know, even as recently as uh, 2016 with Brexit, institutions fail because they don't listen to or detect a radical change that's happening. How can you explain the paradox that the greatest central organization that's probably known to man, which is the Chinese Communist Party, seems to have done a very good job at listening to the people, anticipating what they need, and delivering it? Where are they listening? What are they listening to? How do you explain that paradox? Thank you. Uh, I think we will. Do you have a question, ma'am? Quickly, please. I wonder how America can continue to be um, democracy's greatest ambassador in light of decades now of miseducated or non educated students in civics because they're very seduced now by socialism, right? And that seems to be the direction we're going. How are we going to be the ambassador of democracy uh, as we're increasingly socialist, which obviously leads to communism and then tyranny? All right, Steve, pick two and answer the question. <laughs> um, so let me say something about the 100 years ago and something about China. So if you look, looked at the US 100 years ago, um, you know, things turned out pretty well, but they turned out well, and it, it wasn't just weather. If you think about England, you know, I'm 1688, the glorious revolution in England, which did constrain the sovereign, came only after the English Civil Wars, only after there had been a regicide, only after there had been 10 years, the only 10 years in British history when there had been no monarch, when the Cromwells had ruled as uh, the Lord Protectors in England. So that there was an element of kind of, it goes along with, I mean, there was, there was some accident in this. It wasn't that um, the Stuarts um, kind of agreed to go quietly into the night and William and Mary were invited to Britain. It happened after Parliament had demonstrated that it could actually and was willing to actually kill a king. So I would say, if you think about, I mean, what will the evolution of China will be? I mean, the reason I would bet on it not becoming wealthy and autocratic is that, I, I mean, I don't think we've grown, we've grown rich by exploiting other people. I think there's been a big advantage um, to the globalization of the economy. It's made many hundreds of millions of people and. In China, it li has lifted the matter of poverty and the fact that you can get uh, your little electronic device from, from China for a dollar or two dollars or five dollars, when it would cost you much more in the US, was actually a great thing for the Chinese, even though inevitably they were paid much less than workers would have been paid in the US. But I think there was a lot of accident, luck, and happenstance that led us to live in a society where the government is actually effective and constrained. And I, I, I don't think the Chinese will succeed in, in reaching that point because the question one would have to ask about China is, you know, is it true that if the Chinese continue to let economic development take place, if it's modern China, um, which is outside of the control of the state, will at some point the Communist Party crack down on that and will they be successful? And that's a point, you know, that's a critical issue, and it's unclear what the outcome of that conflict will be. Neil. Uh, 
Question one was, are we going back to 1919 in terms of isolationism? I don't think so. I actually think the isolationism of American populism is exaggerated in much commentary. I don't, in fact, see John Bolton uh, pursuing an isolationist policy. Question two, where will the next military conflict be? It's already begun. It's in cyberspace, and it's us against Russia and China. Uh, question three, uh, is democracy promotion if effectively synonymous with imperialism and the exploitation of cheap labor? No. Uh, what we do need to worry about is the increasing problem of monopolistic power within the US economy. But by and large, those transnational corporations you're talking about are generating employment opportunities for people who otherwise be in even worse poverty. Question four, the campaign finance question. I feel your pain, sir spending five hours a day raising money. But what's the alternative? European-style campaign finance restrictions that put a cap on the cost of elections? The trouble about that, as I wrote in a book called The Cash Nexus, is that you end up with the money finding its way into politics illegally, corruptly, and that is actually worse. At least we have transparency in our very expensive democratic system. I'm nearly there. Question five, do institutions fail because they don't listen? Is the Chinese Communist Party the exception? Yes, it is, because it listens to everything, every Everybody says. <laughs> it has surveillance and photo recognition. You, you, it has the most perfect surveillance system of any totalitarian state ever, and it will not save the system. That's the irony, that you can know everything about what your population is saying and doing and still, I think, succumb to all the problems of a one-party state, all the pathologies that go with a one-party state. And finally, the lack of education and civics. Oh, I could not agree with you more, madam. What a catastrophe we face when young Americans are educated to believe that socialism is okay and free speech is a bad thing. If there's anything that can defeat the project of a free society, of American democracy, it is that. We won't be defeated by China any more than by the Soviet Union. We'll be defeated by ourselves and our own failure to teach the next generation the values that, well, I guess this institution stands for. Thank you. Well, I have only left to thank my fellow panelists, uh, Neil, Steve, wonderful discussion. I want to thank you very much uh, for spending the last hour and a half with us uh, talking about uh, this extremely important question of democracy's future and America's role in it. And as to the last question uh, about uh, teaching civics and teaching history, um, I hope that the next time that we do this, it will be not during spring break, <laughs> and uh, that we will invite uh, students uh, to engage in this kind of discussion, because I do think that the ideas uh, defining a free society for which uh, Hoover stands uh, may not be fully under attack, but there is no doubt uh, that they are not as healthy as they should be, and there is no better way than to make them healthy than to have them discussed and discussed openly. So thank you, and thank you, Tom, for the opportunity to do this. And, and I want to, I want to again, I want to again thank the audience. And if you have the time, please stay with us. We have a reception in the Tretel Pavilion, which is right outside. Please stay and chat. Thank you. <laughs>